from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon, my name is Janice Hyde, and I'm the interim director of the John W. Kluge Center here at the Library of Congress. The John W. Kluge Center is delighted to host today's lecture. The Kluge Center brings together scholars and researchers from around the world to exchange ideas and energize one another, to distill wisdom from the library's rich resources, and to interact with policymakers and the public. The center offers opportunities for senior scholars and postdoctoral fellows to do research using the unparalleled collections of the Library of Congress. It also offers free public lectures, conferences, symposia, and other programs, and it periodically confers the Kluge Prize, which recognizes lifetime achievement in the humanities and the social sciences. For more information about the Kluge Center, please visit our website, loc.gov slash Kluge. I also invite you to sign up for our RSS email list to receive information about future programs and opportunities for research. Today's program is titled Peace and Concord in the Quran. It features Dr. Juan Cole, the 2016 Kluge Chair in Countries and Cultures of the South. Dr. Cole's research at the Library of Congress examines the concept of peace in Muslim scripture. He has traced the evolution of peace and corollary ideas chronologically and contextually through the text with special attention to sets of words grouped together that reference the topic. In today's lecture, he will provide a tour of the irenic messages, those related to peace and concord, embedded in the Quran. Juan Cole is the Richard P. Mitchell Collegiate Professor of History at the University of Michigan. He has authored or edited more than 10 books on the Middle East, including The New Arabs, How the Millennial Generation is Changing the Middle East. His informed comment blog provides historical context to modern day events in the Muslim world. Dr. Cole has appeared on ABC Nightly News, Nightline, The Today Show, Charlie Rose, Anderson Cooper 360, Chris Hayes' All In, Rachel Maddow, The Colbert Report, and Democracy Now. Dr. Cole has agreed to respond to a few questions following this presentation, and I ask that you wait, please, until you receive a microphone before asking your question so that we can record both the question and the response. It is now my pleasure to invite to the podium Dr. Juan Cole. Well, thank you very much, uh, Janice, for that warm introduction, and my thanks to the Kluge Center, whose resources and the, the staff of the uh, Center and the, the Library of Congress have been so incredibly helpful to me in my research uh, this summer, uh, and, and for the, the nice appointment uh, to, to the Kluge Chair uh, this summer. Um, my, my subject, as you have all heard, is uh, peace uh, and harmony in the Quran. Uh, and I'm aware that I'm swimming against the tide a little bit uh, here with this subject, uh, but let me see if I can make my case to you. Um, I want to underline that the Quran, like the Bible, has verses in it about peace, and it has verses in it about war. Somehow the latter get more attention. Uh, and when I first uh, started thinking about writing this book, uh, I became excited at the idea, and then I thought, well, it must have been done to death. So then I went to the bibliographic literature and did a search. I found that, well, there, you know, there are some works on the subject, but it's not a really big literature. Uh, and I was surprised, actually, at how little uh, the subject has been addressed. Uh, whereas there are lots and lots of books about war and jihad and so forth in the Quran. Um, I also want to underline that when I say peace, of course, I'm using an English word. And uh, words have different meanings in different languages. I think of it as a spectrum. You know, typically a word in one language overlaps with part of the meaning of a word in another language, but then there are parts that are left out. So uh, peace in Semitic languages, in, in Hebrew and, and Arabic, uh, scholars have observed is not just the absence of war. It's not the absence of conflict. It, that's 
implied, but uh, it has a positive meaning of well-being. Uh, and so it goes along with, uh, we, we say often peace and prosperity. We use two words to get at probably what uh, the Hebrew Bible or the Quran uh, means by one word. Uh, and um, so, and then not only does peace mean different things uh, in different languages, uh, there's a, a range of semantic uh, 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 signification, but also there are different kinds of, of peace, even in English. Uh, we, we, we say that someone has inner peace. Uh, you could imagine saying that a Marine at the height of a battle was possessed with a kind of inner peace. So inner peace wouldn't necessarily uh, be contrary to being in war. Uh, there's peace with God. We say, and we have the phrase, making, peace, making one's peace with God. Uh, there's peace with members of your in-group. This is a challenge to achieve every Thanksgiving, but uh, <laughs> we make the attempt. Um, there are, there's peace with members of the out-group which is also challenging. Uh, and uh, then uh, there's geopolitical peace. Uh, peace has broken out, we say, in such and such a region. Uh, so uh, in all of these meanings of peace in these various places that it occurs, it's not an absolute. Unlike with pregnancy, you can have a little bit of peace. Uh, and uh, it's on a spectrum. The perspective with which I am going to approach the text of the uh, Muslim scripture, the Quran, uh, is uh, that of apocalyptic literature. Uh, and, and apocalyptic literature has a special meaning in scholarship. We now use the word apocalypse to mean like the end of the world. An event is apocalyptic. But uh, the, the Greek actually just means revelation. Uh, and so apocalyptic literature is not primarily about the end of the world, although it often does advert to that subject. Uh, but it's about a revelation. It's about a special insight being given to a seer. Uh, typically, this kind of literature depicts the seer as ascending into heaven or going on a spiritual journey. And there's usually an angel involved. Uh, and uh, angels, you know, develop relatively late in the Bible, uh, but by the 600s, they're everywhere. Uh, and um, the angel will reveal the secret to the seer or will interpret the secret that has been revealed. Uh, often, but not always, apocalyptic literature has a political dimension as well as a spiritual one. And so this, this, the prophet or the seer will make a prophecy which has a political implication. Uh, and it may or may not involve belief uh, in, in an imminent judgment day, as I said. Uh, that's one of the, uh, one of the uh, frequent occurring, occurring themes, but it's not always there. And when we think about apocalyptic literature in the West, uh, the two biblical books that would immediately come to mind are the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation in the New Testament. Uh, it often involves the prediction of a coming great peace. Uh, apocalyptic literature often sees this world as a, uh, the, the time that we're living in as a maelstrom, but with a promise of a very different kind of world over the horizon. And so I am going to argue that the Quran uh, uh, shares in some of the characteristics of apocalyptic literature uh, of this era. The Quran began uh, coming to the Prophet Muhammad uh, in Arabia uh, in the midst of what I call the, the, the seventh century world war. Uh, there was an enormous uh, conflict that, that broke out uh, roughly 603, 604 uh, of the Common Era uh, between the Persian or Iranian Empire and the, uh, the Byzantine Empire, the late Roman Empire, which had taken Constantinople as its capital, and uh, in the course of which Iran 
took over Syria, much to the dismay of Constantinople. For those of you who follow today's politics, there's nothing new under the sun. Istanbul is now unhappy about Iran's presence in Syria, so Istanbul is what we now call Constantinople. Uh, so, uh, but this, uh, this, this was a, a, a very dramatic set of, set of events because the, 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 the Roman Empire had come into the Near East uh, in the age of Hadrian. Uh, 106, they took uh, uh, Syria and, and, and Jordan. Uh, and, um, and had had this region pretty steadily. Uh, there were occasion, occasional invasions and so forth, but it had this region and administered it pretty steadily since then, from 106 to 614 or so. Uh, and to have Iran come in and just take over the whole thing, and they took Egypt as well, by the way. I mean, this is unprecedented since, since the time of the Achaemenids, since the time of Cyrus the Great. I mean, so it's, it's a huge thing, and that's the context for the emergence of the Quran. Um, Historians have increasingly, uh, uh, in, in, in recent decades, al although this is an idea that goes back to the late 19th century, but in recent decades, uh, especially in the American Academy, uh, historians have become uh, particularly interested in this period that they're calling late antiquity. You know, in the early 20th century, if you studied uh, the classical world, uh, you would study the Republic, the Roman Republic, and then uh, Julius Caesar and Augustus, and, and then, you know, the conversion of the empire to Christianity under Constantine in the 300s, and then, you know, the, the, the barbarians show up, the Huns and uh, so forth, and, and, and Rome falls in, in, in the middle of the 400s, uh, and after that it's the Dark Ages. And, you know, the really bright, aggressive graduate students would want to work on the glorious periods. Uh, so the, who would want to, you know, specialize? You, you have to explain to your parents, you're in, in graduate school for eight years. What are you doing while well, I'm, I'm studying the dark ages? And uh, so nobody wanted to do that. But uh, uh, in, in recent decades, uh, Peter Brown at Princeton and others have argued that if you took kind of 300 or 400 to 800 or so and looked at it as a period, uh, that it, it, it has certain virtues as for historians in understanding the world as it was then. Uh, but in order to make it uh, not the Dark Ages and not, not unglorious, you'd have to move east. You know, admittedly, Spain, Italy, France, they were a mess you know, after 450, uh, Britain too. Uh, the economy went down the tubes and uh, uh, people were much poorer. They, they, they lost technological knowledge that they used to have and so forth. But in what is now Turkey, the Balkans, Syria, uh, uh, Egypt, uh, and, and, and Tunisia, um, those areas, as far as the archaeologists can discover, they were doing fine. They were still prosperous. They still had a great economy. They had a lot of technology. Things were going great. And they were being ruled from Constantinople, from, from what is now Istanbul. And so if you shifted your gaze east, then there's a not Dark Ages subject to study here. Uh, and um, admittedly, it's different from the early classical period in the sense that uh, they are Christians now for the most part. Although, you know, remember that Christianity only became kind of the official religion of the empire in the 300s, so by the early 600s, surely there were still lots of pagans. They had to kind of be quiet about being pagans, but they were there uh, in very large numbers still. Um, they had uh, their own conflicts. Uh, the, the Christian authorities from the late uh, 300s started banning public pagan rituals. So one historian said that, you know, they were still there, but they were quiet. 
Uh, and um, then, you know, there's a saying in the ancient world, uh, in, in, the, in the late antique world, that uh, wherever you found 10 Christians, there would be 11 theological opinions amongst them. And they seem to have really minded if you had a different opinion, like to the point of bloodshed. So there was a very severe conflict and riots and persecutions over Christology, over how you would think about the, the figure of Christ and his relationship to the Holy Spirit and to God, to, to God the Father, and uh, uh, whether he had one nature or two natures and so on and so forth. I won't go into the details, it's very complicated, but apparently it could get you killed. Uh, and then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the, the, the Emperor uh, Khosrow II of Iran uh, was expanding his empire uh, quite dramatically at the uh, uh, expense of, uh, of uh, the Byzantine or, or Eastern Roman Empire. There were serious conflicts with Jews. Jews, of course, by that time, they demographically had lost out. The Christians had become much more numerous. Uh, there had been a period earlier on in, in the Near East where maybe the Jews and the Christians were both you know, kind of persecuted minorities uh, and, and on an equal footing. But uh, uh, by this time, in the late 500s, early 600s, the Jews were a, a, a persecuted minority at the hands of the Christian empire. Uh, and uh, were, were very frequently unhappy and mistreated. And indeed, when the Byzantine Empire did defeat the Iranians and kick them back out of uh, the Near East, um, they blamed, uh, probably hysterically, uh, but they blamed uh, Byzantine Jews for having collaborated with the Iranians. And so it is alleged uh, by later chroniclers that uh, the Emperor Heraclius uh, actually uh, forced baptism on uh, many of the Byzantine Jews. So th these communities were in conflict. Now I want to take you out of the mainstream, away from the capitals of Constantinople and, and the Iranian capital of Tesiphon to a little backwater. Uh, and uh, that little backwater is eastern, uh, is, is, the, is the western coast of, uh, of, of Arabia along the Red Sea. Geographically, it is called the Tahama, uh, but the northern part of it is called the Hejaz. Uh, and there, in 570 or so, uh, we think, um, uh, the, uh, Muhammad was born, Muhammad, uh, the son of Abdullah, from the, the clan of Banu Hashim, uh, and what was distinctive about the city in which he was born, Mecca, was that it, it, it had a shrine. Uh, that black cube-shaped building is called the Kaaba, and uh, it was already a shrine at that time. Uh, it was a shrine, as far as I can tell, to God. Uh, that is to say, uh, the Meccans were had many deities, uh, they weren't monotheists, but they seem to have thought that most of those deities were lesser. And the most important deity was the creator uh, called God. And the Quran talks about this. It says, if you ask them, the Meccans, you know, uh, about uh, uh, the divine, they will say it is God, Allah. Allah is not a personal name. It's, it's, it just means God. It's like the Greek theos. Uh, they will say uh, uh, Allah is, is God and, and he's the creator. Uh, so um, they may have been developing towards a kind of monotheism, uh, those people in Mecca. And this, by the way, is a big debate now in, in the late antique uh, studies field. Uh, some scholars have provocatively uh, argued that Platonists and other pagans in the 500s were tending towards monotheism on their own, uh, so that they were saying theos or, or God rather than Zeus, uh, and uh, they were uh, demoting the uh, pantheon of Greek gods to only a, a kind of angel. Um, uh, so this may have, this kind of thing may have been, been going on in Mecca. And 
Politically, what was distinctive was that Mecca was a no man's uh, land. It wasn't in the Iranian empire and it wasn't in the Byzantine empire, although I think it was kind of on the fringes of the Byzantine empire more. And it had occasionally been part of the Roman empire. In fact, um, uh, Mark Antony gave it to Cleopatra as I guess dowry or something. Uh, uh, so um, uh, Mecca had, had figured in Western history. But it, it was a sanctuary. It, it, the, the Arab tribes you know, were fractious and they were fighting. Uh, and, and yet, in a, you, know, you have tribes typically, pastoral nomads, in, in places where uh, there's a lot of marginal land that you can't really farm very easily. So, but if you raise sheep and goats and camels, you can just go around to where the grass pops up and, and feed them. Uh, so, uh, it, but marginal land isn't, isn't uh, very productive. And so they have to do trade. And there are things you can't produce in marginal land like grain. So, you know, it's not good for you uh, uh, not to eat wheat and barley and those things. It, just to have a Bedouin diet of... Of, of milk and, uh, and, and kebab, uh, you know, it's great, but it's, you, you need the grain. So they have to trade. Uh, Mecca had to trade in, in order to have uh, foodstuffs. Um, but the tribes were always fighting with each other. They're, fe they're feuds, uh, Hatfields and McCoys kind of thing. And uh, however, they made certain places like Mecca a sanctuary, not allowed to fight inside Mecca. That would get you thrown out of the town. Uh, and uh, the reason for they gave for, for it being sanctuary is the holy city, because the Kaaba is there. That's the shrine of God. And there probably already was a sense that the Kaaba had been built by Abraham. That was the Arab story about it. Uh, and um, they also, being the custodians of the Kaaba, the, the Meccans were kind of holy. So they were holy merchants. And sometimes they would go trading to other shrine cities uh, wearing uh, a toga-like outfit that's called ehram in, in Arabic. Uh, so they were merchant priests. Uh, and, and so the young Muhammad growing up in this kind of situation would have seen that religion could function to create areas of peace where otherwise there would be feuding and war, uh, and that it could make commerce possible under some conditions because the Quraysh as custodians of the Kaaba were respected by the other tribes and so their caravans were less likely to be attacked. Um, peace, worship, prosperity, they were all wrought up with one another for a Meccan. Uh, there was, according to the early sources, a uh, movement of people uh, in Mecca and the Hejaz in this period uh, of spiritual restlessness. Uh, and, and people were searching for the one God. Um, uh, some of them ultimately became Christians, some of them converted to Judaism, and by the way, most Yemenis seem to have converted to Judaism. Uh, and um, uh, others were what uh, these late antique scholars are calling pagan monotheists. Uh, they were Platonists. or uh, There was an entire uh, cult of, uh, of a god called uh, Theos Hypsistos, the, the, the high god, the exalted god. And um, that was an independent cult. They thought there's just one, uh, although there might be other gods, they were just lesser beings or angels or demons or something. Uh, and um, uh, so that kind of search for a, 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 some sort of monotheism seems to have been common in this period. And Muhammad ibn Abdullah, who was a, a great merchant uh, of, of Mecca, uh, engaged in it as well. And so uh, according to his third wife uh, and, and youngest wife, Aisha, uh, she related, uh, it is said, that uh, then he began liking solitude and he used to go off alone to the cave of Hira. He would perform devotions, which are a form of nocturnal worship, for many days before returning to his family. He would stock up uh, on provisions, then later return to Khadija, that was his wife at the time, 
uh, and stock up again in the same way. So Muhammad would routinely spend a month of every year in this way, uh, in between caravan journeys up to Syria or down to Yemen. Uh, and during that time, he would distribute food to the poor and meditate. Uh, and one night, uh, an angel visited, according to uh, the early Islamic sources. And there's a, a, a chapter of the Quran, uh, Quran 97, which comments on that night when, when the revelation first came. You know, this, this, the traditions say that Muhammad said he, he, it was like a bell rang in his mind and when it stopped ringing then he heard, he heard voices he, he, and he remembered what the verse, voices had said. They were verses of the, of the Quran, verses of scripture. But in commenting on this experience, uh, the, the uh, Quran 97 says, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, behold, we revealed it on the night of power, uh, it being uh, verses of the Quran, and, and it says, what will make you understand the night of power? The night of power is better than a thousand months. The angels and the spirit descend then with the permission of their Lord in every affair. And peace it is until the breaking of the dawn. Uh, well, remember I said in apocalyptic literature, there's always angels involved. And there's also a revelation of the meaning of something. So it says, what would make you understand the night of power? And then it mentions the angels. This is an apocalyptic overtone. And then the final verse um, is, in my view, it, it's a little bit, this, this surah reminds me of a haiku, uh, the Japanese poetry, because in the last verse of the haiku, you're supposed to take things in an unexpected direction but which builds on what came before. And I think this, this chapter of the Quran does this. It says, and peace it is until the breaking of the dawn. Well, what's peace? Peace in the original is feminine, and the only feminine referent in the, in the verse is night, Layla. So the night of revelation is peace. And the night of revelation, of course, is a synecdoche. It's, 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 it's standing for the revelation itself. So the revelation is peace. And you could interpret this verse in a quotidian way because of, they were staying up late night. Muhammad was staying up late night uh, at night and, and praying. And so there was the peace of worship, the inner peace of, of communing with God, the peace of the revelation coming. Uh, but it could also be uh, that this is a metaphor uh, for the coming judgment day and peace it is until the breaking of the dawn could be peace it is until the judgment day, the resurrection. But in any case, I think this verse is indicating that the revelation, the tanzil that's mentioned in the, in the, uh, in the chapter, is peace. Uh, and then, as I said, the Quran expects there to be a judgment day, a resurrection day, uh, and uh, the People will be raised from the graves and they will be judged and the wicked will be sent to hell. And <clears throat> uh, that's really a horror story. I won't go into it this afternoon. We may not have the stomach for it. But, uh, but the, the, the good will go to heaven, uh, will go to the garden. Uh, and when they get there, the Quran says, the virtuous are admitted to paradise with a greeting. Uh, presumably the angels are saying, enter in peace. This is the day of eternity. So the first thing that happens when you go to heaven is, is your peace is wished upon you. Uh, and then the Quranic heaven, as has been pointed out by many critics, is um, really a great place. Uh, and, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I could get in, but if I have my choice, it, you know, this would be the one I'd want to go to. Um, so it says uh, at one point that the, the, the spiritually, the foremost spiritual people of the past, and, and, and it says, by the way, they're mostly ancients and only a few moderns. Uh, well, what that means is they're mostly Jews and Christians, right? And only a few Muslims. Uh, so it's a multicultural heaven that's being envisaged. Um, and it says that they're sitting on ornament, ornamented thrones and then reclining on them face to face. 
and immortal youths are constantly serving them, cups and goblets and chalices filled to overflowing, uh, but it will not give them a hangover or make them drunk. Uh, and there will be fruit platters from which to choose and whatever fowl they have appetite for and wide-eyed heavenly maidens like hidden pearls as a reward for their good deeds. Therein they will hear no abusive speech nor any talk of sin, only the saying, peace, peace. So all of, of all of the delectations of, of heaven as, as presented here, uh, the, the ultimate one is peace. Um, in another uh, chapter 36, it says, only a single cry will, will ring out. That's the angel Gabriel blowing the trumpet, the, the resurrection day. Then behold, they shall all be gathered before me, God is speaking. On that day, no soul will be in any way wronged, and you will only receive the just deserts of your deeds. The dwellers in the garden on that day will delight in their affairs. They and their spouses will repose on couches in the shade. They will have fruit and whatever they call for, peace. The word will reach them from a compassionate Lord. So there's, uh, I would argue this uh, chapter of the Quran envisages heaven as, as having levels. It's kind of like Dante's Paradiso. And that uh, you have bliss, repose, enjoyment of heavenly fruit, and then the highest level is when God says to you, peace. The word will reach them from a compassionate Lord. Um, scholars have noted that in this one, uh, it talks about the spouses being together in heaven. So those guys, you know, who are hoping for the virgins, they, they should be reminded that the wife will be along. Uh, and... Um, uh, so um, let me just make an, a, a, a suggestion here that these images of heaven are not, uh, are not unconnected to earth, that the Quran is modeling human society for us. Uh, and this vision of peace after the resurrection uh, the heavenly community is a model for earthly life. So paradise is imagined not as a solitary experience because people are talking to each other. The, the inmates of heaven are wishing peace upon one another and the angels are wishing peace on them and God is wishing peace on them uh, and they are uh, uh, surrounded by delectations as a result of this harmony and peace. Uh, but it seems to me that if the Quran is depicting peace as so desirable that it's the ultimate reward of heaven uh, bestowed by the very voice of God that it, it, it views peace as an ideal in this world as well and that, that, that hell is therefore a punishment for the unpeaceful life. Beyond that, the gathering, chapter 59 of the Quran, has a verse in which it says, he is God, other than whom there is no God, the King, the Holy, the Peace, the Defender, the Guardian, the Mighty, the Omnipotent, the Supreme. The Peace. Peace is a name of God. It's the, the names of God in, in the Quran and in Muslim tradition are the virtues, the attributes of the divine. So God is peace. Uh, and of course, this is something that occurs in the Bible as well. Uh, uh, Job uh, uh, says that dominion and fear are with God. He makes peace in his high heaven. Uh, in uh, the Hebrews uh, 1320, it, sp it speaks of the God of peace. Uh, so uh, as God is peace, so too is the fruit, the highest fruit of heaven. Um, Fred Donner at the University of Chicago has argued in a recent book that the early community of the, of, of, uh, around Muhammad, uh, as far as we can tell from the Quran, uh, was not sectarian in character. That the people who gathered around Muhammad uh, and listened to his preaching and supported him, some of them were Christians, some of them were Jews, some of them were pagan monotheists, and some of them you know, were adherents or partisans of him, what we would now call Muslims. But the word uh, 
that's used in the Quran for them is believers. Uh, those are the ones who, uh, who followed Muhammad's teachings. Uh, the, the word Muslim does occur, but it, it's um, uh, less, uh, less ex exalted as a station than being a believer. Uh, the Muslims acquiesce, they submit, uh, but the, the, the believers, you know, commit. And uh, so there's a, a later verse of the Quran, uh, 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 the Cal 262, uh, which says, surely the believers and the Jews and the Christians and the Sabians, whoever believes in God in the last day and works righteousness, their reward awaits them with their Lord and no fear shall be on them, neither shall they sorrow. The Quran is promising salvation to all the monotheists, to the people who believe in the one God and who the judgment day and who do good works. Um, the Quran is more Jamesian than it is Pauline. Uh, it thinks that both faith and works are necessary. Uh, and um, this is, I can't tell you how remarkable this verse is because that's not how the late antique world worked. Uh, if you went a little bit north from Mecca up into the Byzantine Empire and you were with the Patriarch of Jerusalem or the Patriarch of Antioch or the Patriarch of Alexandria and you asked them, you know, who's going to heaven? It wouldn't include this group. It would only be the Christians and maybe only a few of them, you know, the, not the heretics among the Christians. So this is uh, very unusual uh, that, that the Quran talks about this kind of universal salvation. Of course, it does exclude the polytheist polytheists. Uh, I would argue, you know, this word Sabian, now the Muslims have forgotten what it meant. Personally, I, you know, I blame them because wouldn't that be important? Like, if your scripture said, this group is going to heaven, they're saved. When well, you want to remember who they were, I mean, that would be important. But no, the later Muslim tradition seems confused about this issue. I think that they were the pagan monotheists. Uh, and I, I, I won't go into the, 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 the linguistic details, but you know, there was no word for monotheism at that time in Greek. The believers, the people who had good faith were called uh, Evsebia. Uh, and um, uh, the, the verb to be to, to be God-fearing or to worship was sabo. And I think it came into Arabic as a loan word, sabah, and so it became the, the, the people who were God-fearing were, were the sabaun, were the Sabians. Uh, and that word occurs in the New Testament like uh, when, when Paul talks about the good Gentiles, the, the, the people, the pagans who worshiped in synagogue with the Jews and who were God-fearing. That's the word that's used. So I, th I think there's a, a reason to think the Sabians were the pagan monotheists. But in any case, uh, all of them are going to heaven, apparently. Uh, and so heaven is multicultural. It's, you know, as aside from our conflict, it's very much like the United States. It's good Christians, mu Jews, Muslims, uh, they're eating well, delectations. They're not always good, but... Uh, uh, the, the Quranic heaven is, is not just for Muslims. But there are also the hostile pagans. There were people in Mecca who minded Muhammad's message for various reasons. One of them was that he denounced some of their deities. Uh, apparently the Quran is all right with them having uh, deities as long as they would agree that they're just angels. Uh, there can't be any independent sovereign power except the one God. But uh, they didn't always agree to say that. And then the Quran also, it didn't think that you can have female angels. And so some of the goddesses were objectionable to the Quran. And it has this verse in Quran 53, then have you seen Alat and al Uzza and, and Manat the third, the other one? Do you have then boys and God only girls? That would be an entirely unfair division. They are only names you have given them, you and your ancestors. God has revealed no sovereignty thereby. They only follow their assumptions and the seductions of their carnal souls, but guidance has come to them from their Lord. 
So the goddesses were being denounced by the Quran, and the, most, the, the, the Meccans seemed to have really liked the goddesses. The, the Meccans, the North Arabian tradition, uh, didn't uh, typically have idols. Uh, they, they were aniconic, or they didn't have images. Uh, they were like abstract art. So that first image there on the top is a, um, a betel, uh, or a nasab uh, stone, uh, which the goddess is supposed to be in there. Uh, but it doesn't have features. And sometimes under the Greek and Roman influence, they would uh, put features on the, the betels, uh, as you can see in the second one. But those were being denounced by the Quran. And at that time, there weren't that many followers of Muhammad, and Mecca it, it, as a city was hostile to the new prophet, uh, and so um, uh, there were conflicts. I would argue that the conflicts weren't very severe because Mecca was a sanctuary. No fighting in Mecca. Uh, so they couldn't like, kill each other. Uh, but the pagans in Mecca, according to the Quranic sources, uh, were just unpleasant, like really unpleasant. They would boycott people, refuse to marry their daughters. In fact, uh, Muhammad had two daughters that were married to uh, a pagan and, uh, 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 and, and his father made them get divorced, sent the girls back. Uh, and uh, then they would socially boycott them. Uh, and, you know, since it was a trading city, I think it's implied also that the, the e there were economic deficits to being boycotted. Uh, and then, you know, there are stories that Muhammad was sitting in the market one day and uh, one of the pagans, uh, uh, um, Abu Lahab uh, was actually his uncle, uh, came and, and threw uh, sheep innards on him. And according to the Muslim traditions, you know, he just wiped them off, went on. Uh, so a, a lot of the traditions, it's interesting to me, depict Muhammad and the early Muslims as, um, as extremely nonviolent in the way they re replied to this uh, harassment. And I find that this is supported by the verses of the Quran. So uh, during this time of persecution in the six tens in, in Mecca, the Quran says, and if they impugn your veracity, uh, say to me my works and to your works, you your works. You are not responsible for what I do and I am not responsible for what you do. Uh, that in other words, live and let live. Um, uh, the criterion, Quran 25 uh, says, so do not obey the hostile pagans, rather struggle, struggle thereby steadfastly against them. So they're not supposed to put their heads down, they're not supposed to give in, but uh, they have this live and let live uh, kind of attitude. Uh, by the way, this is one of the first uh, uh, parts of the Quran where the word jihad appears. The word struggle here is jihad. This is jahidhum uh, bihi kabiran struggle steadfastly with it, against them. And uh, the Muslim commentators are very frank that with it means with the Quran, with peaceful discourse. Uh, so the uh, jihad went out to have other meanings, but the Quranic uh, meaning of it here is uh, disputation uh, in a nice way uh, with people who don't agree. Then the Quran in uh, 28, uh, uh, 50 through 57, contrasts the hostile pagans with those Christians and Jews who had recognized that Muhammad was uh, uh, receiving revelation from God. The Quran doesn't insist that people believe, you know, become Muslims, but it insists that they not say that Muhammad is a liar, that, he, that he's deliberately falsifying things. So those Christians and Jews who said, well, you know, he seems to be a prophet, uh, he, he's getting revelations from God, whether they joined or not, they're being praised. And, and uh, they were, because they were associated with the Muslims, apparently the pagans were bothering them too. So the Quran says, these shall be given their wage twice over because they patiently endured and they avert evil with good and expend of what we have provided them. So they're generous, they do philanthropy, and uh, they're patient, they endure taunting and harassment with the, uh, uh, with the Muslims. Uh, 
uh, from the pagans, and they avert evil with good. Does this remind you of anything? I mean, it's very much like Jesus' principle of turning the other cheek. Uh, and the Quran is praising them for behaving in this way. Uh, and the believers face down evil by performing good deeds rather than by committing violence or returning evil for evil. And then in 2855, uh, it's talking then about the believers, about the people around Muhammad himself. And when they hear abusive talk, they turn away from it and say, to us our deeds and to you yours, peace be upon you. Uh, we do not seek out the unru unruly. And again, peace be upon you is a, is a prayer. It's, it's calling on God to give them peace. Uh, this is to the people who are ha taunting them and, and insulting them. And, uh, you know, it was said that the people would throw thorns in their path. So, you know, if you were walking barefoot, suddenly your foot would be bleeding. Um, then in Quran 2563, it says, and the servants of the all-merciful who walk humbly upon the earth and when the ignorant taunt them, they reply, peace. So in this period when the Muslims are first starting out and they're in the city of Mecca, uh, there's this, you would have to say, a very Christian-like attitude towards their persecutors. Now, later on, uh, from 622, uh, Muhammad and the Muslims had to relocate. Uh, they came under so much pressure and the Quran complains about this, that, that there was, the, the Meccans were trying to expel them, uh, that they had to go to a nearby city, to, to Medina. Uh, and um, uh, once they went there, war broke out between them and the Meccans. My own interpretation of this is that actually the Meccans wanted to get Muhammad and the Muslims out of Mecca because they couldn't attack them there. It was a sanctuary city. So they were, there, there was nothing they could do to them as long as they were in the city, except, you know, put social pressure on them or economic pressure. But if they could get them out, then they could attack them, and I think they wanted to. Uh, and so once the, the, the uh, Muslims went to Medina, um, war breaks out. Uh, the Quran, you know, talks about... Um, uh, fighting, and, and, the, and the Muslims were willing to fight in what the Arabs considered sacred months. And when criticized for fighting in the sacred month, when you're not supposed to fight, uh, the Quran uh, says, yes, that's bad, but it's not as bad as expelling people from the sanctuary city. And you know, there are some crimes that are ancillary, like in the Old West, uh, a horse thief, if, if caught, would be hanged. Why? Because if you stole a man's horse, you very likely were killing him. In, in the Old West, I mean, a man without a horse out in the desert, that, that, was, that was death. So people frowned on horse thieves. Uh, in the same way, if you kicked somebody out of a sanctuary city, you were exposing them to attack. And that's what the, the pagans had done to the, to the Muslims. Um, but even in the midst of the conflict that emerged, and there were three big battles and, uh, and some other raids, uh, the Quran has a, what I would argue is a, is a kind of uh, a theology of just war, uh, similar uh, to what exists in Christianity, is often attributed to St. Augustine of Hippo, but uh, our scholars have argued that in, in Augustine it's not a doctrine so much as some remarks. But later on, you know, Aquinas and others worked on it. Uh, but um, I think it's similar. So the Quran in 21, uh, uh, in, in, two, in, in, the, in the second uh, chapter, 190 verse, says, and combat in the way of God against those who initiate combat with you, but do not commit aggression. God does not love aggressors. And slay those hostile combatants wherever you overtake them. This uh, verse is often taken out of context. And if you go out on the internet or you listen to uh, people uh, who have an ax to grind uh, talking about Islam, uh, they will say, well, see, the Quran says, slay, the, slay them wherever you overtake them. Uh, it's, it, it's commanding Muslims just to go out and randomly kill people. It's not what's going on in the verse. The referent of those is the ones who attack the Muslims. So it's, it's, a, it's an argument for self-defense. 
Uh, and moreover, because it says fight the ones that fight you, uh, it implicitly, and Muslim scholars have noted this, is saying you're not to fight non-combatants. So women, children, non-combatant men are not to be attacked. Um, and St. Augustine said when you are arming for battle, the will should be concerned with peace and necessity with war. War is waged in, a, in order to attain peace. It's very much what the Quran is saying because in 861 it says that if the enemy sues for peace on just terms, the overture should be accepted. And if they incline to peace, then you should incline to it and put your trust in God. He is the all-hearing, the all-knowing. So if the enemy is fighting you and then they come and say, no, we, we, we decided to call it off. Um, according to the Quran, you have to call it off. Um, and, and it is worth noting that in, in history, actually, according to Muslim tradition, the conflict between Medina and, and, and Mecca was resolved with the treaty, ultimately. Not, Mecca was not actually militarily con conquered in the end. Um, I think there's, there's probably an apocalyptic context for these Quranic ideas about peace. Uh, in 614, uh, Jerusalem fell to the Iranians. Uh, a, a general, Shahar Waraz of, of the Sassanid Iran, took Jerusalem. And this just, I mean, colloquially speaking, I could say it freaked people out. Uh, and uh, because Jerusalem, uh, since the time of Constantine, you know, had been in the hands of, of, the, of the Christian Roman Empire. And now it was not. And uh, the, the, the monks and clerics who wrote about the Persian, uh, uh, the Iranian occupation of Jerusalem uh, appear to have exaggerated substantially uh, the horrors of it because the Israeli archaeologists have been digging quite a lot in Jerusalem and they got down to that level. And according to the Byzantine sources, the Iranians burned down all the churches and they killed 90,000 people and well, you know, there should be bones down there, ashes and things like that if, if, if the city had been subjected to that kind of ravaging. But they don't find that. Eh, it seems to, goes along, that layer is prosperous, the next layer is prosperous, it seems to go on, no sign of the churches, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre doesn't seem to have actually been burned down. So um, the, the literary sources from the Byzantine side are just incorrect. Uh, but, um, but it was a big shock uh, for the, the Christian uh, Roman Empire to lose Jerusalem to the, to the Iranians, who were not Christians, they belonged to the Zoroastrian religion, uh, didn't recognize Christ, and um, they um, did carry off the, rem the relic of the true cross, which was in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, to Tesiphon in what is now Medayan in Iraq. Uh, and uh, so it was a really kind of, Khosro II, the, the emperor of Iran, was really sticking it to, to the emperor of, of Byzantium, Heraclius, uh, and he was saying, take that. And what's interesting is the Quran uh, talks about all this, and it says uh, in, in, in chapter 30, Byzantium lies vanquished in the nearest province, uh, in, but in the wake of their defeat, they will triumph after a few years. Before and after, it is God who is in command. On that day, the believers will rejoice in the victory of God. He causes to triumph whomever he will, and he is the mighty, the merciful. It is the promise of God. God does not break his promises, but most people do not know it. Now, this verse, uh, in my view, has been completely misinterpreted uh, by, the, by uh, the later Muslim commentators. Uh, because uh, they, don't, they don't take it seriously enough. This verse is saying that the victory of the, the Roman Caesar, Heraclius, over Iran is God's victory. And it says that the believers, the people around Muhammad, will rejoice at that victory. Well, two decades later, the, the Muslim Arabs defeated Byzantium and took over Syria. So from the point of view of the two decades later, this verse is a little bit of an embarrassment because it's making Heraclius a big hero. Uh, 
It's saying that God was with him. And then by the 630s, the Muslims are fighting Heraclius. They're saying that Heraclius had a nervous breakdown about that. Uh, but um, I think that in the context of the 610s, this is a statement that the Muslim God is universal. And you know, this is not unprecedented because uh, in uh, Isaiah, Cyrus the Great, the Iranian Achaemenid king, is called the anointed one of Israel. Uh, so just as Yahweh was a, is a uh, universal God, so the God of the Quran is universal and can acknowledge the Roman emperor as his instrument. Uh, but that the, the believers would rejoice in his victory suggests to me something more. I think at that point, the political theology of the Quran envisaged the Muslim Arabs as joining in some way the Byzantine Commonwealth. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe as citizens, because Byzantium did have claims on the Hejaz, or maybe as in the same way that the Ethiopians did, when the Ethiopians were generally allied with the Romans. Uh, but it seems very clear to me the Quran is making a stand against Iran uh, and, uh, and the Zoroastrian uh, Empire and, and is, is being partisan for Byzantium. Now, the later Muslim commentators will say things like, well, this is a prediction that the Muslims will have a great victory in the same year that Heraclius does. But that's not what the verse says. There isn't any reason to interpret it that way. Um, then, uh, at, in a similar period of time, there is a verse that maintains that Muhammad had a vision in which he traveled by night to Jerusalem. And in the context of this other verse, it seems to me that in, in the context of ap apocalyptic literature about Jerusalem, because you know it's a symbol for the afterlife, for peace, if you read the book of Revelation, that Muhammad is, is reappropriating occupied Jerusalem spiritually from, from the Iranian Empire uh, in, in that night journey. Now, there's a, a Jewish piece of writing from the same basic period uh, which, uh, by a contemporary of, of the Quran, uh, but, but writing a little bit later after Iran was defeated, which says that in this apocalyptic uh, piece of writing, uh, uh, the, the Sefer Eliyah, uh, that a, cel a celestial Jerusalem will descend from heaven, its houses, gates, and thresholds will be constructed of precious stones, and within its restored temple will be treasures including the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible, and peace. Torah and peace will be in the New Jerusalem that descends for, uh, from heaven. And uh, this author cites uh, Psalms, great peace have those who love your law and nothing can make them stumble. I haven't completely put all this together yet, but I think that the, the Iranian conquest of Jerusalem was a big spiritual crisis uh, for not only for the Byzantines, but for uh, Muhammad's believers. Uh, and you know there was a point at which the believers prayed towards Jerusalem, uh, and that there's uh, some kind of apocalyptic expectation of a defeat of the Persians, uh, and then what comes next. And it might even be a kind of, of civil millenarianism that the Muslim Arabs would then be able to accede to the victorious Byzantine Commonwealth. Uh, so, in conclusion, I'm arguing that Revelation, Tanzil, is identified with peace in the night of power. That members of all religions revering the one God according to the Quran will go to paradise. That Christians and Jews who accept that Muhammad was a prophet are praised for fighting evil through good and for wishing peace on enemies. That the early Muslims are also praised for wishing peace on those who harassed them. Uh, that they are commanded to make peace with hostile combatants wherever the hostiles sue for it, uh, that the good of all religions are greeted on arrival in heaven with wishes of peace and well-being, both by angels and by one another and by God himself, 
that the highest level of paradise is when God wishes you peace and that the peace is one of the key attributes, the names of God himself. And that those people who can read the Quran and see it only as a violent document are missing out on the parts that I read. Thank you very much. Well, anybody who uh, talks at you for 50 minutes uh, ought to take some questions uh, and let you be satisfied about your objections, doubts, and so forth. Let's have short, uh, and there should be a question in it, please, short responses. And please wait until the microphone gets to you because this is being recorded. My name is Intifat Qambar, I'm Iraqi-American. And uh, you just uh, mentioned the vision of uh, Prophet Muhammad, of his uh, going to J Jerusalem, uh, Surat al-Isra. And uh, there is a, I've met many Muslim scholars who said this verse may might have been inserted by uh, the Amawi uh, Khalifa Abdul Malik bin Marwan in order to legitimize the Islamic conquer of Jerusalem. Some Islamic conspiracy theorists uh, blame it on the Jewish conspiracy to uh, legitimize the Muslim presence, presence in Jerusalem. Uh, first of all, I'd like you to comment on this theory, which is uh, and uh, many theories like this, which, for example, negate the necessity for hijab in Islam, or alcohol is uh, not necessarily prohibited. Even Abu Hanifa, which I grew up and I born next to in Baghdad, uh, do not prohibit alcohol, for example. But the environment of fear in the Arab world and the Muslim world refuses for any idea, even if it's a crazy idea, to be proposed and negotiated or discussed. Mm. And I'd like your comment on this issue too. Thank, Thank you, you very you. Very, very much, uh, Antifad. I know, I know you're writing, and yes, the, the, thanks for coming. Listen, um, yeah, this is an important question because when we talk about the text of the Quran uh, from a Western academic point of view, and even as you said among traditional, some traditional Muslim scholars, there's a whole question of is the Quran that we now have uh, how much of it goes back to the time of the prophet? Is it, is it really from his lifetime and, and so forth? Uh, and, and there's a whole school of uh, academic scholars in the West uh, that uh, come out of uh, uh, typically Soas uh, in Britain, uh, which doesn't think that you can trust any of these sources, that the, the chronicles and the biographies and uh, uh, so forth uh, uh, we have are you know, the earliest manuscripts that we can date and, and the dates of the authors are, you know, from uh, 150, 200, 300 years after the time of the prophet. So that makes a person nervous as a historian because, you know, I can't remember what I had for dinner last week. Uh, and and depend, depend on, depending on people for a memory of 300 years before is, is pretty dangerous. Uh, and then um, uh, there's been arguments that the Quran you know, was produced by more than one hand and over time. And for any of the more pious Muslims in the audience, I apologize. I don't mean to offend you, but this is what the scholars, you know, have proposed. Um, I'm a conservative on this issue. I think the Quran, you know, came through the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and uh, I think that the traditional dating of it, 610 to 632, Ah, you could tinker with it, but it's just about right. And I find contemporary things being referred to, like we know when the Byzantines were defeated by the Iranians, and so that verse which talks about it uh, must, must be from you know, 614, 615, that must be from that period. Uh, so um, there is now some evidence for the integrity of the Quran and for the traditional dating coming out of manuscript work. In the, in the, in the, 80, in, in the uh, 1980s, I went to Yemen 
And they have a manuscript uh, repository in Yemen, which, you know, for any historian, it's, it's just wonderful. But they found these old, old, old Qurans in the great mosque in Yemen. And they brought in the Germans to uh, assemble them and study them. And I talked to Ursula Dreibholz, who was in charge of this project. And she said, we're quite convinced that some of these, you know, the papyrus, the script, they look to us seventh century. Uh, and then one of them turned out to be a palimpsest. This palimpsest is in the old days, you know, paper or papyrus uh, uh, and so forth, uh, parchment was expensive. People would write over things. So they found uh, uh, one of these Qurans, which was uh, uh, in, the, you know, in the 650s, the Caliph Uthman published a standard Quran, which is all the printed Qurans you have are from that, uh, that underneath the standard Quran was an earlier one. Uh, and they radiocarbon dated it. And you didn't get exact figures from radiocarbon dating, but you get percentage likelihoods. Percentage likelihood of this one, 645. And it's not, it's not the standard recension. It's the order of the, of the chapters is slightly different. Not a lot of, you know, there are variants, there are not a lot of significant ones. But if we now have a Quran 645, the likelihood of the text we have, in, we have being uh, integral is much higher than it used to be. There's also been a find in, in Paris and Birmingham of, a, of, a, of 16 pages of the Quran. Two of them have been carbon dated, and they came back 570 to 640. Uh, the 570 would be a challenge because we think that's when Muhammad was born. But in, in any case, that's a parchment. That animal that that Quran is written on lived at, at the same time as the Prophet Muhammad. We're quite sure about this. Now, could somebody have used an old parchment and written out the Quran on it? Maybe we don't know. This, these things haven't been settled. But I would just signal that the extreme skepticism and this kind of Soaz school that wanted to see the Quran as uh, a, a tradition that grew up over maybe two centuries, that's increasingly implausible. Uh, the, the, the Quran we have is, I think, ballpark uh, for, for uh, the period, and so I think we can approach in this way. So I, I don't know if the, uh, uh, the Surah Isra is in the uh, palimpsest that's been published. I should take a look. But I, I think probably it really is a vision of Jerusalem and I'm arguing it makes sense because uh, I think maybe there was a, a dialogue in Mecca that the, the pagan Meccans might have been siding with Iran. And Muhammad was talking up the Holy Land and the prophets of Jerusalem and Jesus and Moses. And the, the pagans might well have been saying to him, well, your Jerusalem's gone, isn't it? It's in the hands of the fire worshipers now. Uh, and, and so I think maybe having a vision of it in which uh, uh, Jerusalem inspires the prophet as a way of spiritually pushing back against that line. You guys take the question. You decide who gets them. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. Um, I don't know if you've read uh, Graham Wood in The Atlantic, which I imagine was very pedestrian for you, but he essentially argues that groups like ISIS tried to hasten the coming of the apocalypse through, I guess, war mechanisms. And you've argued quite convincingly today that the Quran is a, uh, you know, a text of peace. But I guess the question is, is, is war and conflict a prerequisite to get to an eventual peace? And is that allowed? Thank right. you. Well, in apocalyptic literature of the time, it's quite frequently the case that it is the seer foresees a war and conflict before peace can come, and this is the shape of the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel, uh, and, and, and there are a number of contemporary works both by Christians and Jews uh, of the time of Muhammad which, which have that shape. I don't find it in the Quran. I don't find this expectation of a conflict uh, preceding the outbreak of peace uh, because um, uh, even before uh, the conquest of Jerusalem, uh, the Quran is, uh, as, as the German scholar Noldeke dated it, this, the chapters at least, uh, the Quran is already laying out the schema 
where there's revelation, there's a warning, uh, there's signs of the coming of the apocalypse, and then uh, there's the judgment day and the resurrection. And those chapters don't really t bring up anything about war. The, the signs of the resurrection uh, or the judgment day, uh, the end of the world in, in the Quran are, tend to be natural. So that will be a day on which, you know, the uh, mountains are like wool that you carted from, from a sheep and they'll just be blown by the wind and, uh, uh, and, and the stars will fall and lose their brightness. Uh, so the, the signs in the Quran for the judgment day aren't typically the marching of armies. Uh, and the, the, one of the early uh, verses which does have a social content says, that will be the day on which the unborn child, the unborn girl, will ask why, why was she killed? And uh, you know, the, in, in pre-modern societies, or, or, or the newborn girl, I meant to say, uh, the, in pre-modern societies, female infanticide was a birth control method. And uh, uh, archeologists in, um, in Egypt uh, have, have found large numbers of you know, babies, basically, uh, uh, who were killed in this way. Is, and anthropologists will tell you that uh, the, the fertility of a group is determined by the number of women in it. Uh, and so if, if a famine has come, if, if, if it's hard days and so forth, people at that time would often kill their, their girl children, uh, their girl babies. And uh, the Quran <laughs> remonstrates with them. It, he, it thinks this, this is very evil. It's a feminist corner of the Quran that is defending the girls. Uh, but uh, it says that on the resurrection day, you know, that's the, 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 the babies will ask, you know, what, what did we do to deserve this? So that's the major social, you know, intervention that I can think of with regard to the apocalypse in the Quran. So no, with regard to ISIL, uh, a, a lot of those guys were ex bathi military. I don't know if you've ever hung around with ex bathi military, but um, I don't think they know how to pray. Uh, and they like a good stiff glass, glass of whiskey. Am I right, uh, Intifan? <laughs> yeah, Abu Bakr himself, the leader of ISIL, does have a PhD, but a lot of those guys with him, they're just uh, dusted off uh, Baathi officers. So I think they're manip manipulating you know, Islam for their purposes. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's sincere with them. Uh, and uh, some of the rank and file might be sincere, but you know, we've had a chance now to study ISIL a little bit academically. There have been exit interviews because you know, people have left. Leaving is chancy because if they figure out you're leaving, they will kill you. Uh, but some people managed to get out and then anthropologists and, and researchers have gone and talked to them that what was it like and, and so forth. And they find these people who have escaped, they often didn't know very much about Islam in a formal sense. So the idea that Graham Wood put forward in this Atlantic article that, you know, ISIL is very Islamic, I don't know what he meant by that. In fact, that seems to me very essentialist. Like, what would it mean to be very Islamic? Uh, are some things more Islamic than others in some kind of essential sense? Uh, certainly, they think they're Muslims, but then, you know, those snake handlers and the... Uh, South think that they're Christians. Most of us, I, I wouldn't want to argue with them that they're not Christians, but we don't typically think that snake handling is, in fact, central to Christianity, even though this group maintains that that's so. So I think that the ISIL people are more the equivalent of the snake handlers in Islam. They, they have a very peculiar set of ideas of what makes for being a good Muslim. And I don't know how you reconcile the things that they do with the text of the Quran. Uh, do, you're only supposed to fight combatants. Well, they don't just fight combatants. They kidnap ordinary innocent people and behead them. Uh, that's not uh, Quranic. So um, to the extent that, that I'm comfortable with point, putting my finger on some normative elements of the Quran, they don't seem to accord with them. Uh, so, you know, I don't know. I, I studied religion as an undergraduate, and, and in religious studies, we don't typically say things like something is very, very Buddhist. Uh, that that <laughs> seems, you know, seems not to be a useful way of thinking. 
Uh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to get back to the Mirage, the uh, vision of the trip to Jerusalem. And basically, in Quran, uh, Jerusalem is not mentioned at all. The uh, trip was to Al-Aqsa, Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, the furthest mosque. And the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem wasn't even built until after 700. So how did that, how and when did that get connected to Jerusalem? Well, uh, that, that's a good question, as of course the Quran is often elusive and we are interpreting it uh, to say what uh, we think it means, but um, here's my argument for it. You remember that verse I mentioned about the fall of uh, uh, the, the, the Byzantium being defeated in the, the nearest province? It says al ard al-Adna, the nearest province. Then when it's talking about al-Masjid al-Aqsa, it's the farthest, nearest, farthest. Now, um, let me just show you the map. If you look at this map, if uh, Mecca is in the, in the uh, Hejaz, if you go north into B Byzantine Syria, that's the nearest province. And if you keep going, they used to go up to Gaza, uh, which was the port on the Mediterranean. If you keep going up to Gaza, that would be the farthest province you could get to before you got to the sea. So I think the masjid, which is in, is the farthest, is, is in Jerusalem. And the, the word masjid, uh, it doesn't mean mosque. Uh, we're talking 614 here uh, or something. Uh, there were no mosques. Uh, and it, it is a a Semitic word uh, which uh, means something like altar. Um, uh, and the, the pagans in those, those blocks that I showed you would, would sacrifice at the bottom of the block there would be a masjid or a, uh, an altar. Um, my guess is that uh, what's being referred to is uh, the Basilica uh, Aya Sion, the, the, the Church of, the, of Holy Zion which was the only religious structure anywhere near the Temple Mount at the time Muhammad was talking, because of course the temple itself had been destroyed by the Romans, and then there were some synagogues up there which were destroyed by the Christians, uh, and so the only religious edifice on the, anywhere near the Temple Mount on the Western Hill was the, was the Basilica of, uh, of Holy Zion, which was a place of pilgrimage and was associated with some of the events of Jesus' life. And I think, a little bit speculative on my part, but I'm, I'm gonna put it forward, that the Quran sees a, um, a connection between the Kaaba in Mecca and the Basilica in Jerusalem, uh, and that this is an axis, uh, and, and that's why for, for a while they prayed towards Jerusalem. Uh, and then they switched to praying towards the, the uh, uh, Kaaba, but both of them are worthy of being the, the, the sinazir, the, the point of prayer, uh, and, and have a spiritual connection between them. Uh, and I think the Quran refers to uh, uh, Jerusalem as the Holy Land, uh, and it also obviously feels that Mecca is the Holy Land. So I think there's, there's a kind of sacred geography at work here. And that's how I would see it. Um, I just want to remind everyone that this program will be available. You can, um, there's lots of food for thought here. So I think we'll all want to look at this again. So in a few weeks, make sure you check back on our website to see this program. But you can visit it in the meantime to see other programs similar to this. Um, I would like to thank you all for coming very much today. Please join us for some refreshment, but first, please thank our speaker, Dr. Juan Cole. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.